Welcome back. This lecture is going to conclude our survey of the cardiovascular system. And today we're going to look at now the one area we've been ignoring, and that is the blood itself. The substance that's being pumped by the heart and transferred and transported by the vessels and then distributed to the areas of need. This is a very, very complex system, and we're really just going to scratch the surface, but I think it'll give you a good overview of what happens in this system. We call it an organ system. An organ is a series of tissues of different kinds that function together to perform one certain task in the body. This may be a very complex task or a very simple one. For example, the skin is an organ. It is the waterproofing and the protection of our body, and it functions as one system, although it's made up of many different kinds of cells and tissues. The blood, too, is therefore an organ, and it's very, very complex. We have about somewhere between five and six liters, nearly quarts, in our body total, about a gallon and a half, and it constitutes about eight or nine percent of our total body weight. If you take blood and you put it in a test tube, and you put it into a centrifuge and spin it down, you get something that looks like this. The heavier particles sink to the bottom in a centrifuge, and the lightest part stays at the top. The red blood cell layer, which are called erythrocytes, site is a suffix that means cell. You're going to hear that a lot. Hepatocytes, for example, in the liver. Erythrocytes merely means red cells. The red blood cells constitute, in the average person, about 45% of this total linear mass. And it's somewhat lower in menstruating women who are, have a chronic low level of blood loss, but percentages less than 30% are considered severe anemia. At the top, we get the biggest layer of plasma, which is a clear yellowish liquid, and that comprises about 55% of the total volume. And then right in the middle is this white layer, which was named the Buffy Coat, uh, just by its gross look. And this contains all the white cells, the fighters of infection. And this comprises usually about 1%, although certainly not 1% of function. It's a very important functioning part of the system. We have another term you're going to hear a lot about, actually two terms we you go to the doctor and they take some blood and they'll tell you what your hemoglobin and your hematocrit are. These are measurements that tell us about roughly about the same thing. The hemoglobin is the amount of the molecule that carries oxygen in that red part of the blood. And the hematocrit is another way of measuring the same thing and it's just the percentage of red blood cells. So here this person's hematocrit is 45% the hemoglobin, if you want to know a number, is usually about a third of that. Could be 13 or 14 percent. Uh, sorry, 13 or 14 grams is the way it's measured, actually. Um, and then if you look at the plasma, the plasma is made up of uh, lots and lots of proteins and water. It has the function of carrying clotting proteins. It carries the antibodies that we need to fight off infection. And it also uh, carries electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride, and so forth. The function of this blood system, and again, it is a system, is multiple. It is used for transportation. We need to carry gases to the tissues in the form of oxygen. We need to carry gases away from the tissues in the form of carbon dioxide. We need to bring nutrients to the tissues, sugars and proteins and fats, which is basically the wood for our metabolic fire. And then we need to carry um, the wastes away from the system and get rid of them in the body. The gases go out of the lungs, the wastes sometimes go out through the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, and the metabolic wastes are disposed of in other ways, for example, liver and kidney. And these are basically the ash from the fire. These have to be removed. The blood also transports hormones and other chemicals. 
from where they are manufactured to where they are needed. The adrenal glands put out adrenaline and send them to the heart, uh, these molecules to the heart so that it can make the heart beat faster. So it is a transportation system with many, many roles. And finally, it's a system of protection. The blood system has to stop bleeding, has to fight infection, has to f recognize and fight off uh, foreign invaders. And so it is what we think of sometimes as the second line of defense, the skin being the first line of defense. And finally, it has probably what may be its most important function, and that's called homeostasis, keeping things the same. There was a French physiologist and physician named Claude Bernard who said that the body needs to maintain the constancy of the internal milieu. And this means that we have a very, very fine range, a very narrow range in which we can live. For example, if you think about body temperature, we live in a range of about 98.6 to 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Any drop below that of only a few degrees can cause hypothermia and death. And elevations above that make us very sick. And if you get up to 106, 107 degrees in an adult, you can start talking about organ and especially brain damage. So that's really a very narrow range of temperature. When you consider there are days I'll go outside in Montana and it'll be 30 below zero. And there are days also in Montana where it's 105 degrees. And with the help of our body mechanisms, and clothing, which allows us to increase that range, we're able to maintain a good regulation of our body temperature. It also, most importantly, needs to maintain something called um, pH, or our acid-base balance. And I want to just make a slight digression because this is going to come up a lot to define the body's pH scale. This is what's called a logarithmic scale. So the range here, very short, distances on this scale really mean very large changes in the body. The pH range in chemistry is defined between 0 and 14. 7.0 is exactly in the middle, and that's neutral. Any number smaller than 7, I'm not going to go into the actual chemistry of this, but any number smaller than 7 is acidic, and it goes down in big levels. So 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 are huge jumps enormous jumps. They're not jumps of 1, 2, and 3. They're jumps of 10, multiples of 10, which can get very, very big. For example, stomach acid can get down here around the 1 to 2 range. Concentrated form could eat through a handkerchief. When you get up on the basic side, what we call alkaline side, uh, those are numbers above 7 and getting up to 14. Again, multiples of large numbers, exponential changes. Look at our body's range. We exist in a range between 7.1 and 7.4, and anything else is severely abnormal and can cause great disturbances in almost all our systems, vascular um, and cardiac and respiratory systems. So something has to be done to keep this pH range around 7.1 to 7.4, and the blood is one of the main components that does that. We'll talk about respiratory physiology in another lecture, and that also is heavily involved in maintaining proper pH. We also have to maintain our heat, as I mentioned, in that very narrow range, and that's done primarily by shunting and by upregulating or downregulating the speed with which we burn the wood fuel in our fire, our metabolic fire. And that's um, regulated by a very, very complex hormone system, which I'll talk to you about much later in the course. I want to digress again now and talk to you about one of these mechanisms, which we tend to defeat. And we've talked a lot about the shunting of the capillaries and this blood system. The blood can be used to measure the heat. The core temperature is the temperature of the blood in the body. And in a situation of extremes, for example, extreme cold, the body is very good at shutting down all the flow to the surface of our skin. Because when we're cold, we want to conserve heat. The skin can get along very well without a good blood supply for many, many hours. 
And that's why our, our extremities and our skin get very white when we're out in the cold. And in extreme cases like frostbite, it turns snow white. Your fingers may become snow white and actually damaged. Same thing happens when you're too hot. The blood is then shunted away from other organs to the skin where evaporation and cooling can occur so that we can reduce the temperature of the blood. Well, when we get into a situation of extreme cold, some of us have been skiing too long or out playing in the snow, one of the most common things to do is to have a drink. Remember the old St. Bernard dog with the, the brandy keg rescuing the people in the snow? When, and this happens because alcohol is a very strong skin vasodilator. Alcohol in the blood gets to those precapillary sphincters of the skin, preferentially, and opens them up and allows the flow to go back to the skin. Well, the reason this mistreatment ever got started was it feels good. You're out in the cold and your, your skin is just very cold. You're shivering. You take a, enough alcohol to paralyze those sphincters and all of a sudden all the flow goes to your skin. You feel warm. And there's a glow. And you feel terrific. And what you're doing is killing yourself because you're allowing all that heat to dissipate into the air that you need for your core, for your heart, uh, for your lungs, for your blood. And with enough time, you will freeze to death. You'll become hypothermic and then suddenly go downhill and crash. So alcohol is, is really the curse of the outdoorsmen and, and people who are trying to rescue those who are in trouble from hypothermia. Let's go to the composition of the blood next because this is an area that uh, we're going to look at again and again. If we look at the whole composition of the body's fluids, we look at the bo total body weight and about 92% of this total body weight is fluid and other tissues, bone, muscle, so on. But remember that most of the tissues themselves, other than bone, are mostly water. Muscle is mostly water. The liver is mostly water. These tissues are very, very wet. If you look at the whole blood, it's about 8%. If we take just the whole blood and ignore the rest of the water, we look at the plasma, we said that was 55%, and it broke down into mostly water. 95% is water. You have dissolved solutes in waste products, such as ions like sodium, potassium, uh, urea, things we want to get rid of, uh, such as urea. And then the proteins, which are 7%, and they constitute albumin, which is very important, um, building block, the globulins, which are very important for the immune system, fibrinogen, which is a clotting factor, and then some others. The other solutes, as I mentioned, are electrolytes, gases, some of the nutrients, and other signalers, regulatory substances, which I won't talk about now. This brings us back to this important 45%, which are the formed blood elements. Now, we're going to look at this in more detail, but basically we have white cells called leukocytes. Leuco means white. Red cells, erythrocytes. And then we have some things called platelets, which are here look like little shattered, broken dishes. That's exactly how they got their name. Here in the breakdown, these run in normal ranges of four to five million in a cc of blood. The white cells are five to 10,000. Somebody with leukemia, the white blood, may have 100, 200, 400,000 white cells. And they happen to be bad white cells because they're malignant. And I'll talk to you about those at some time later. And then the platelets, which are somewhere in this range of 250,000 to 400,000 in a CT, in a CC of blood, and that's a lot. Uh, and they look like the little broken particles. And then there's a further breakdown of the kinds of uh, white cells that I won't dwell on now because we're going to go into those one by one a little later. The um, erythrocytes basically capture and hold oxygen in the hemoglobin molecule and then they release that oxygen when they get to the tissues. They then pick up carbon dioxide, bring that out, to the lungs for excretion. The um, erythrocyte looks like this. There it is showing it at eight microns in diameter. Uh, 
and it's a biconcave disc. And if you look at this shape, the reason this shape evolved is that it's very good for the exchange of gases. If it were a ball, it would also be good for the exchange of gases, but it would take up too much room. So what evolution did was it got rid of its nucleus and it just made it pure hemoglobin inside this disc. This disc can also fold, a ball can't fold, and it can get through narrow spaces sometimes. And when the red blood cells are actually first formed in the system, and we turn over our red blood cells about every 120 days, um, they actually have a little nucleus. And we can tell if somebody is anemic or fighting an anemia by seeing too many nucleated red blood cells in the blood. Because those should go away. Those are the immature forms. If you go to much, much greater magnification, you look at the hemoglobin molecule inside the red cell, it looks something like this. And this little disc is its iron base. Fe is the chemical symbol for iron, ferrous or ferric, and it is an iron-based molecule with nitrogen and carbon and hydrogen, which is what most biologic systems contain. Now, there's a lot of these molecules in, in hemoglobin. In every red cell, there's about 300 million of these. There's a lot of oxygen-carrying capacity in them. And they have a very high affinity for oxygen. And the affinity is pH-based. Now, they also have a certain affinity for the carbon dioxide. And it's a beautiful system because what happens in this system is that different pHs occur in different parts of the system of the cardiovascular system favoring the release or the retention of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So when you have blood with oxygen on it, the hemoglobin with its attached oxygen molecules coming to the tissues, the pH at the tissue level is just right for the release of the carbon dioxide and the retention, I'm sorry, of the oxygen into the tissues and the retention of the waste carbon dioxide. When it gets back out to the lungs, the pH changes slightly. And this complex molecule favors the absorption of oxygen and the release of carbon dioxide. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful system. There are some problems, and we always get into the problems here. There's another molecule that looks very much like carbon dioxide, and it's called carbon monoxide. In our world, incomplete combustion results in carbon monoxide, both in the atmosphere, in artificial pro products, and also in our body. If you look at this slide, when you combine a hydrocarbon, this is hydrogen and carbon, and I have it in quotes because it's in varying um, combinations throughout our body. Almost all of our body are some combinations of hydrogen and carbon. That's organic chemistry, organic material. When it burns in the flame of combustion with oxygen, oxygen supports combustion, the product is usually carbon dioxide and water. We can do, deal with the water, we can deal with the carbon dioxide, two oxygens. But in situations of incomplete combustion, for example, if you burn your uh, improperly ventilated stove indoors, you will release with wood which is also hydrogen and carbon, carbon monoxide. It doesn't have enough oxygen for the complete combustion. Badly tuned uh, carburetors in cars, bad wood stoves, all sorts of sources for carbon monoxide in our environment. It happens that carbon monoxide is drawn and held by hemoglobin at 200 times greater affinity than oxygen. So if you fall asleep in your car or in your bedroom with a badly ventilated heater, charcoal stove, you start breathing carbon monoxide, it will attach to the hemoglobin and it won't let go. And it'll get to the body tissues and it won't let go and it'll stay in the circulation. And this is why people suffocate with carbon monoxide poisoning. 
They also look like they're breathing pretty well because their face is flushed. They have this cherry red skin appearance because carbon monoxide, when attached to hemoglobin, doesn't look bright red the way our oxygenated blood does, and it doesn't look bluish purple the way venous blood does. It looks cherry red. So it fools you for a minute when you see somebody in this condition. And what we do to um, cure this problem is we give the patient as much 100% oxygen as we can and try to force the equation, the chemical equation, by overloading the system with oxygen. You breathe in the air about 21% oxygen. And we force this to 100% and we can force the equation. So if you can get the patient before they've had brain damage, uh, then you can force the uh, ca carbon monoxide off the molecule and replace it with oxygen. And that's what you do. You take the patient out of the room, put them in the air and get them oxygen as soon as possible. That's the function of the red blood cell. And as I said, it has a very rapid turnover. You have a whole new system of blood in your body for the red cells about every 120 days. Made in the bone marrow and then released into the circulation. That brings us next to the leukocytes, the white blood cells, which are very important and very diverse. As you see from this chart, we have several types. Something called the hematopoietic stem cell is the origin. Now a big topic of conversation because of stem cell research. Basically, stem cells are the cells from the original union of the sperm and egg that are multipotential, sometimes called pluripotential. They can become anything. And then when signals are given to them, they start differentiating. They become different from other stem cells, going down different lines, muscle, they may become myocardium, they become brain, they may become blood, they may become bone. Those are called determined stem cells. They have been determined on a path. They can't change that path. Then you get down further along the line, they differentiate more into very specific cells until you have in the bloodline a hemopoietic stem cell. This is the stem cell that will become all the other blood elements. Some of them become erythroblast, you will hear the word blast meaning an early young form, a red early young form with nuclei, and it goes further along differentiation until eventually it loses its nucleus, which is destroyed and reused, and then you have the erythrocytes we talked about. You then have this next line of stem cells, which differentiate again, and they form basically three kinds of white cells, all with different functions. These eosinophiles, which merely means I love the red color, or the pink color, uh, because they tend to look pink under the microscope when we stain them artificially. In nature, you do not see them with any color at all. All these pretty pictures are the artificial chemical stains we use as a standard so that we can see them under the microscope. They'd be otherwise invisible and translucent. These cells are involved with allergy responses. You have this middle line here, very important cell, called neutrophils. And they call them neutrophils because we used to call them polymorphonuclear leukocytes, which was too much for anybody to say. It merely meant that their nuclei had different shape. Polymorpho, different shape, nuclear leukocytes. And these are the main bacteria-fighting elements in our blood. And we have basophils, which stain dark. That's this basal color. And they are involved in allergy um, processes. Then we have monocytes, which become a wonderful term, the wandering macrophage. It's a very romantic term, I think. Macrophage means a big eater, a big cell that eats a lot, and this wanders through the body, eating up debris, dead cells, things we've killed. And finally, another line of these lymphocytes, which break down into several kinds. I'm going to go into great detail in our lecture on the immune system, almost entirely about lymphocytes, so I'm not going to talk about them too much, except to say that they do uh, play their role in the immune system. Finally, this megakaryoblast becomes a megakaryocyte, um, meaning big, and they break up into platelets, these tiny little fractured particles, and those particles are the ones that help us stop bleeding. They have lots of functions. Um, they mainly alert us to stranger danger. 
and they can release chemicals called lysins and perforins, which can perforate foreign dangerous elements, cells, let's say, of a cancerous type, foreign bodies, and break them up and destroy them. Um, they can move out of the blood vessels, get into the tissue, and attack the danger there, whether it be bacteria or something else, foreign body like a splinter of wood, can actually eat it up and destroy it. Um, once they go out of the system, they can never come back in. So they either die or destroy themselves. Once they've done their body, they're very altruistic cells. The human blood is sterile in normal circumstances. If we take human blood and we try to grow it either in an auger dish for bacteria or in tissue culture for viruses, we should get no growth ever. This is not true of many animals. Normal animal tissues such as dog have certain bacteria. Dogs, cats, other mammals that we might equate our own body with have bacteria as a normal part of their body. We don't. We have sterile tissues. If there is bacteria in our tissue, that's an infection, we know that's bad. If you have bacteria in your blood, that's called a bacteremia. Emia is the suffix for blood. If you have virus in your blood, for example, if you had polio or the flu, um, you get a viremia. Those cause a violent reaction. You get very sick when you have that. This is when you get shaking chills and fever and headache and drops in blood pressure sometimes. It can be more or less serious, but it usually tells you very quickly that you're not well. That's bacteremia and viremia. There's something called septicemia, and it's slightly different and much worse. Bacteremia and viremia, those foreign organisms, the infectious agent, are just circulating in the blood. In a septicemia, they're growing in the blood. They're reproducing and multiplying in the blood. They're just not on their way somewhere else. That's very serious. That has a very high mortality to it. People die from those types of conditions. Um, and finally, we look at the platelets in the blood. The platelets are a fascinating bunch of broken down cells. What happens when the platelets become called into action is that there has been some bleeding taking place. If you look at this slide, here's the blood circulating, here are the red cells, here's the lining of the cell wall, and here's some damage to the endothelium, the blood cells lining. You see the single layer of cells that line the internal side of our vessel. There's some damage, stab wound, a tear, a bruise. Signals are sent to these platelets which have been circulating with it and they aggregate in this area. It's called chemotaxis. They're being called or sent by chemical signals that something is wrong and they form a big group of them together aided by other chemicals. And finally, they will form a plug along here to stop the bleeding. That's called platelet aggregation. They're very effective at forming this kind of barrier early on, and they're not very good for the long term. They then trigger a cascade of reactions that's very, very complex, far beyond the scope of this course. Usually an entire semester or a year's course in itself has to do with blood clotting and hemostasis. Hemostasis meaning stopping of bleeding. But I wanted to give you this little picture because it's so complicated and just give you an idea how easily it might be sent out of whack. Here are two vessels. This is tissue trauma. This side shows some intrinsic problem, blood trauma. Remember I said how clots propagate clots? Well, other problems inside the blood vessel itself can cause and be considered trauma to the blood itself, as opposed to trauma to the vessel. Both of those release factors. Here's This one is called tissue factor, and this one is the damaged cells themselves, and then they release this enormous flood of chemicals. You have activated platelets, and these Roman numerals are the numbers of different 
chemicals. We call them factor 1, factor 11, factor 7. And they cascade. They literally, like a waterfall, one comes into the system and strikes the next, activates it. It goes on and activates the next, and they require all of them to be activated in a very precise manner. And they form a clot. And that clot is the more permanent clot. The platelets have just plugged the leak. It's the finger in the dike. But somebody's got to take that finger out of the dike at some point. And you need something to form a clot. And what happens is, in this vessel, a big clot will form all along the vessel itself. And the patient will stop bleeding. For example, this plug here, which is soon going to be destroyed by the body, will now be replaced by a plug of clot all the way along the whole lumen of this little vessel, however big that vessel is. Why is this cascade so complicated? Why does it have so many fail-safes and actually places where it can become interrupted? The reason is you don't want your blood to clot inside your vessels because clotting begets clotting. So if we had one little clot in there and then it started to propagate at both ends, where would it stop? You would clot. You'd become a solid mass of jelly. And that would be the end. There's actually a disease where this happens. It's called disseminated intravascular clotting. In other words, widespread clotting inside the vessels. It occurs with very serious infections. It can occur with cancers. Major disturbances in the human body cause disseminated intravascular clotting, or DIC. You, and that patient has a funny symptom. That patient starts to bleed. Why would this patient start to bleed? Well, obviously, if they're alive, the whole body isn't clotted. Just a lot of it is. And these clotting factors, which I've just shown you, tend to consume lots more clotting factors. And this is called the consumption coagulopathy. Something wrong with the clotting system because it's consuming the factors. So the patient's got lots of clotting all through their body in bad places that they don't want them. The clotting factors are being used up in there, and what's left of the blood doesn't have any clotting ability. And you're constantly tearing capillaries you never know about, and they're being repaired. But all of a sudden, this patient starts to bleed out of their nose and their eyes and their mouth and their GI tract, and they have bruises all over, and they will die of blood loss, even though their problem is clotting. It took great courage when they figured this out for the first doctor to say, you know, this patient needs an anticoagulant. How are we going to give them an anticoagulant? They're bleeding to death. And somebody, many decades ago, said, we need to give these patients heparin. Once they understood what was happening, they said, maybe we need to stop the bleeding by getting rid of all this hyperclotting. Those patients were treated with anticoagulants, and it worked, if you get it early enough. So you have this very, very complex system, uh, a system that's... Um, extremely sensitive, finely controlled, can go wrong. When we give patients whole blood in transfusion, uh, we are actually giving them blood that does not have clotting factors in them. Those are lost. And so what we have is special pooled reservoirs of clotting factors. A patient gets so many blood transfusions, and then we give them some clotting factors to boot. Patients with hemophilia, which means I love to bleed, um, those patients actually stop bleeding initially. Their platelets are okay. They're missing one of those factors with the Roman numerals. And those patients then bleed again after the injury, and they don't stop until they bleed to death or until we transfuse them with that factor that they need temporarily. And they must be protected from trauma. It's a genetic disease. It's often inherited. And um, it has varying degrees of seriousness and varying degrees of which factor is absent. So that's bleeding, and we've talked about thrombosis in the past. We've talked about other clotting where we don't want it, for example, in the, in the veins and the legs and so on, and getting thromboembolism, blood clots tearing loose. That's a very quick look at a, an enormous, enormous subject. I want to move on now and talk a little bit about the control of blood pressure and uh, how that works. We're going to talk about some of that later when we get to the brain. But basically, we control blood pressure and rate 
and volumes by basically adjusting the pump. That's our first line. We have heart rate increases and decreases, and we have stroke volume that can increase and decrease. We talked about that in the first and second lecture. And now we have some fine regulation. There are receptors in the body, and they're in the carotid artery in the neck, that big branch that's the first one that goes to the brain. Guess why they're there? The brain wants to know immediately as the blood's on the way up, what's happening in the system. Something called a baroreceptor. You know what a barometer is, it measures pressure. Baroreceptors are in the carotid artery and it measures precisely second to second blood pressure changes. It is a system that tells the brain immediately if there's a drop in the blood pressure. There are also some of these receptors in the brain itself, and the brain only wants to know one thing. Is the pressure going down? The brain says, I don't want the pressure going down. The brain doesn't even look for why the pressure is going down. It doesn't have receptors out in your arms and your feet and your intestines to maybe figure out the diagnostic side. We're the diagnostic side, not the brain. The brain only wants to know that the pressure is going down, it doesn't care why, and it will do everything it has to do to signal the body to bring that pressure up immediately. Because if the pressure doesn't come up immediately, you will faint. And once you faint, you're in a much worse position than you were a second ago. The long-term solutions to these problems come later. Now, this can be dehydration, bleeding, drugs, anesthesia, it's a whole variety we've talked about and we'll talk about more as to why the blood pressure would drop. Brain doesn't care. Brain says, I need the blood. Here's what I'm going to do to get it, and it does it. It will signal, uh, for example, uh, the kidney in cases of dehydration or blood loss. It doesn't care what it is. It just wants the kidney to stop making urine, not let you get rid of any more water. It will stop blood flow to certain organs. It will do anything. And you can fool the brain. It's rather interesting. You can, for example, tell the brain there's too much blood pressure. And we do this in medicine on purpose. Those baroreceptors are right under my finger. You all who put your finger against your neck can feel the carotid artery pulsing sometime right between the big sternocleidomastoid muscle and your trachea. You'll feel your carotid artery. There's a disease that we didn't talk too much about. I mentioned how the heart rate can go up to 300 per minute. It's called PAT, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. The atrium just goes ripping off at 300 beats per minute. It's huge. And you can't tolerate that very long. And it happens paroxysmally, suddenly, suddenly ending, suddenly, suddenly ending. Patients are very susceptible to this, certain people with diseased hearts. What we do is we want the brain to send a signal to that patient to slow down the heart. I'll tell you how that happens in our brain um, lectures, but right now know that there is a nerve that can slow down the heart. What we do as doctors is we take a thumb and we rub really hard on the carotid right over those receptors. And we put pressure on those receptors and the receptors go, oh, high blood pressure, because we're squeezing them. It sends a signal to the brain that says, whoa, high blood pressure, and the brain sends a signal to the heart that says, slow down. Pressure's too high, you're gonna blow out a vessel, I'm gonna have a stroke. And the heart slows down, and you can break the tachycardia just like that. Go we'll from 300 back to 80. And there's a very simple way, by understanding the physiology, that we're able to apply without fancy diagnostic matters, without any drugs, without any equipment on hand, just press on that carotid body. We don't press on both carotid bodies. Think, well, if one is good, two would be better. The fact is, the carotid is the root of blood to the brain. We'd like blood to keep going to the brain while we're pressing, so we leave one side open and we press on one. Not something you should do, and next time somebody says, my heart's racing, please don't do that. Um, but this is something doctors can do in the right situation. I want to talk to you now, before we finish, about shock. Shock is a... Uh, uh, a subject that is misunderstood, a term that is used uh, usually incorrectly. The definition of shock is a state in which the body cannot maintain sufficient cardiac output 
to supply the needs of oxygen and nutrients to the cells, and it can't have the circulation to remove the waste and the gases. People talk about shock, shock to my environment, a shock to my system, uh, emotional shock. They often mistakenly cause, uh, use the word shock in referring to the brain when they really meant a stroke. Shock is very specific. It means failure to maintain your cardiac output in sufficient levels. Now, shock causes the blood pressure and the flow to become too low. The patient is not getting enough flow. And if it persists too long, it can become irreversible, and the patient may die. There are different kinds of shock. There is shock, and we define this, by the way, with the blood pressure, exactly by the blood pressure. We use the measurements of millimeters of mercury. In measuring pressure, we get a column of mercury in a tube. If you remember the old-fashioned blood pressure cuffs before the days of a dial or digital, we had a column of mercury in a tube, and we pumped the amount of air that would force the mercury up the tube against gravity. And we measured in millimeters. Why? We could use water, we could use alcohol, but mercury, it's a tube about that high, 120 millimeters. If you used water, you'd need one bigger than the room. And if you used alcohol, even bigger. So mercury was chosen because it was a heavy liquid. The normal blood pressure of us sitting here is probably between 110 and 120, over 80. What does that mean? It means when our systolic pressure is at its greatest, the ventricles have pumped, it pushes the pressure up to 120 millimeters of mercury, and during the runoff, it'll drop to 80, the elasticity of the vessels holding it there until the next one. Okay? We consider shock sustained systolic levels below 80. That's where we get really scared. If people who walk around with systolic levels of 90, and they're very lucky people because they're not doing much damage to their vessels. Prolonged high blood pressure is just the opposite. It's very bad for you to do. We can get shock from hypovolemia, too low a blood volume, or we can get it from, from active bleeding, that again is a volume situation that results in dehydration. We can get, uh, get it from certain drugs which cause our vascular system to open up and make the capillary bed too big. We can get them from infections, endotoxins, which do the same thing. We can get it from cardiogenic shock. We can have our heart fail to put it out. It's a very bad sign after a heart attack. Those patients often die. We have neurogenic shock, which is fainting. That's when I show you a horrible picture up here that you weren't expecting, and you end up on the floor because your brain wants to shut itself off from that exposure, and that's why you faint. So hypotension, lowered blood pressure, is the definition of it. We have three kinds of shock. Basically, we have stage one, which is called compensated non-progressive shock. That's basically when you faint. You have no cell damage, no cell death, nothing permanent happens. Your body responds by lowering your body to the full floor. You faint. You get ver uh, horizontal instead of vertical, and the blood will flow back, reestablish the volume for you, and you'll be fine. Nothing needs to be done, except to allow the patient to fall down. Holding a patient up, keeping them erect in an elevator when they faint is very bad because you can't correct it. Crucifixion often killed those people crucified by holding them up too long. They were kept on the cross for days and days and days, and eventually when they fainted, they couldn't fall down, and they couldn't correct their shock. Finally, there, the second stage is decompensated progressive shock in which cells are injured and it's about 25% of blood loss volume, and you need to rehydrate that patient, reestablish the volume, and they will be okay, they'll recover. They do not need to have anything further than the reestablishment of the volume, the rate, and so on, but they do need treatment, because if they are not treated, they will go into what's called stage three, or irreversible shock, in which there is organ damage, which is not reversible, and then you have a very bad cascade in which the heart is depressed, the blood gets acidotic because it's not getting rid of the CO2, which is acid, and the lungs are not able to compensate, 
the blood becomes acid, the heart is depressed by acidosis, they are unable to vasoconstrict anymore, they lose that ability, so they can't raise their own blood pressure, and that patient goes rapidly downhill, no matter what the treatment is, and they will all die. So that is our quick journey through the physiology of the cardiovascular system. Next time we'll continue with the respiratory system.